begin. Um, so, welcome to the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Lecture Series. Uh, this has been running for about three years now. Some of you will be familiar with it, some of you won't. Uh, the lecture runs once a month, last Tuesday, for every month here at the gallery, except in the summer. And uh, I've got a few little news updates before I introduce our speaker. Uh, so next month's talk is Dr. Ben Sessa, we're going to have a debate and a discussion about MGMA for its use in psychotherapy. Uh, there'll be uh, the ex-drug czar David Nutt will be coming along as well and joining in that debate, so do come along. And then the month after that we have Gary Lackman talking about cosmic consciousness. So some uh, great light of it as usual. Um, we've also got a few books in the, the, the making as well. We've got a book together of the lecture series. It'll be out soon in the Strange Effects Press. And we're working on a book from the, uh, the conference we put on last year, Breaking Convention, uh, which some of you may have been to as a psychedelic convention. And we hope to, uh, New Zealand now, we hope to have a new uh, Breaking Convention, a Breaks and More Convention is next year, hopefully in London at the University of Greenwich, with a bit of luck. So I hope you join me in that. Um, tonight's speaker, we're very lucky, very pleased to have. Uh, I would say he's probably the UK's best writer on drugs. Sometimes he's having a bit reassured us on that, that point. Wow. Um, great accolade there. <laughs> I'm sure he's an excellent writer as well. <laughs> uh, Mike's written a number of fantastic books, a lot of them on drugs, oh, about drugs. <laughs> uh, Emperor of Dreams, um, The Atmosphere of Heaven. And some books on other topics as well, such as the Heirloom uh, Gang, which is being re-released through Strange Attractor Press. And also this fantastic book, which came out of the, uh, the collection at the Wellcome Trust that he curated, um, which is in High Society, which is going to be the, the theme of tonight's talk. So without further ado, Mike, please take it away. Thank you very much. Cheers, thanks very much Dave. Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, yeah you either, either can't hear me at all or you're like, it's okay, yeah. Um, right, well, um, high society, I mean the idea was uh, um, a really good slow delay on here, which is, uh, the, the, there we go. Yeah, this is the exhibition which was just up the road at the Welcome, which ran last winter. And the idea was to take a sort of really big view of um, drugs, mind-altering drugs, all sort of through history and different cultures around the world. So um, obviously the first thing you have to do is to define what you're talking about, you know, because um, the word drugs has at least two different meanings. There's one which is an older one, which just means generally sort of medication. And we still have that, of course, you know, drugstore, super drug, whatever. Um, but then there's drugs in the sense that we're going to talk about um, tonight. Um, and that's a kind of different word. What's interesting about that, I think, is, um, you know, sort of drugs in the general sense is very neutral. Drugs in this specific sense of mind-altering drugs, that's a very loaded word. It's got a lot of very negative connotations, kind of drugs as a sort of bad thing. Um, so one of the things I'm going to be asking um, tonight is why that is and um, how we got into that um, situation. Um, I think one of the um, sort of negative connotations that lurks behind the word drugs is illegal drugs. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, when you say drugs to people, most people kind of have like a little dividing line in their head and they kind of divide between, you know, legal drugs and illegal drugs. And actually when they say drugs, they're talking about illegal drugs because you don't talk about, um, you know, coffee as a drug, you don't talk about alcohol as a drug, although of course they are. So uh, that's why I wanted to kind of, um, you know, Specify by calling it mind altering drugs, you know, so because I don't think that that division between legal drugs and illegal drugs that's not in any sense a kind of primary distinction, you know, um, as particularly once you start kind of taking a bigger perspective, a bigger historical and cultural perspective. I mean, to take a really obvious example, um, alcohol, you know, as we know perfectly well, um, in the last century in America it was illegal. There's still plenty of places around the world today where alcohol is an illegal drug. Um, and if you look at some of the other drugs, as we'll, um, we'll be doing things that you know, people now call not just drugs, but hard drugs, you know, things like cocaine and heroin. A uh, hundred years ago, you could go into any high street chemists and buy them straight off the shelf. 
So that was the idea, really, was to kind of um, break apart this distinction that people have in their minds between legal and illegal drugs and uh, look at the whole thing. I mean, here's a good example of um, why drugs is, uh, you know, the negative connotations of drugs. It's actually to prove to be incredibly hard to advertise an exhibition about drugs. For example, um, you know, Google Ads, you can't use drugs as a keyword, it gets automatically blocked. Uh, and the London Underground have uh, incredibly strict rules about what you're allowed to show in ads and what you're not allowed to show. Uh, so we're not allowed to show any actual drugs on the Underground, you're not allowed to show any people taking drugs. That's why, uh, in the end, we ended up with a like, caterpillar advertising our drugs exhibition. They come on, it's a children's book, you can't ban that. <laughs> so that was the, this is, a bit, of, this is a, a bit of the exhibition, and that was the idea then, was to put together things that we don't even think of as drugs at all. Things like, um, you know, coffee and tea and alcohol, and put them together with um, kind of things that we think of as street drugs, like sort of heroin and crack, and also with sort of psychedelics. Um, but also particularly with um, uh, things that might or might not be drugs, um, psychoactive substances um, and plants that are used in other cultures around the world. So, for example, like cat, which is a sort of stimulant leaf that's chewed in sort of Yemen and East Africa, or kava, which is a sort of narcotic drink from the uh, Pacific, or um, you know, coca leaves, which are chewed in South America, or betel nut. These kind of things... Um, they're all very interesting in their own right, but they're also very interesting to think with. You know, what box do we put them in? Are these kind of good drugs or bad drugs? You know, we're not quite sure. So that was the idea, was to sort of mix um, all these sort of different sort of global ideas together. And also to um, move back through um, history. This was the uh, final installation in the exhibition. Uh, and this was sort of the beautiful sort of tracking shots um, around... Uh, uh, poppy plantation at Afyon in um, Turkey, in central Turkey, uh, with some oud music accompanying it. And um, Afyon has, uh, you know, poppies have been grown there, you know, since prehistory. Uh, so um, if you look back to the very earliest written sources about drugs, kind of classical Greek sources and stuff, they'll talk about opium and they'll talk about it coming from these poppy fields here. And then um, you know, by the 17th, 18th century, then um, poppies from here were being used to produce opium that was going to be sold to Britain. So people like um, Thomas de Quincey or Samuel Taylor Coleridge, you know, when they were sort of drinking their laudanum, you know, that was all um, opium from these poppies here. <coughs> In the 20th century, um, it was uh, uh, criminalised and prohibited, but um, people carried on growing opium poppies here because they always had done. Uh, so the opium from these poppies then started ending up as um, street heroin, you know, on the streets of, um, uh, of London and European cities. And then, um, more recently, um, the um, poppy cultivation there was licensed by the UN, so the, um, uh, the opium that comes out of these poppies now is turned into um, codeine and morphine, you know, for our uh, pharmacies and hospitals and stuff around the world. So that's just a really nice image of how you know, um, these plants have been grown since prehistory, complete unbroken line, but our engagement with them, our relationship with them kind of keeps on changing. So that, I mean, the question then that you kind of, that leads back to, I guess, is when did people start taking drugs? So, um, so that's, I mean, I think the short answer to that is that um, we were um, probably taking drugs a long time before we were human. You know, if you look at uh, animals, there are a lot of animals use drugs in the more general sense, like to sort of chew up um, poisonous plants to kill off intestinal parasites and all that kind of thing. But also there are lots and lots of examples of animals um, who use mind-altering drugs, intoxicants to get high. Um, cats and catnip is an example that you might um, think of immediately. Um, catnip doesn't work really on humans, but uh, on cats it's a very powerful euphoriant and brain imaging studies show that it makes them hallucinate and all that kind of thing. Um, elephants are another, um, particularly love alcohol, so um, you know you often get um, elephants, kind of uh, herds of elephants congregating where there's a lot of fermenting fruit on the ground and eating it and get, getting drunk, and particularly in um, India where in rural India, where there's lots of states where alcohol is prohibited and you get a lot of illegal stills out in, out in the bush, 
um, um, elephants kind of sniff those out and will tip them over and kind of drink up all the hooch and kind of, you know, drunk elephants rampaging through villages is quite a common hazard in uh, rural India. And then when you get towards, you know, sort of um, monkeys and primates, you get, uh, you know, much more obvious sort of uh, drug-seeking behaviours and monkeys and apes will readily pick up um, habits like sort of smoking tobacco and captivity. So I think... Um, Taking drugs is basically part of our animal inheritance, and that explains why it's such a universal habit. Um, you know, pretty much every culture that you can think of, you know, sort of around the globe and through history, has used mind-altering drugs in one form or another. But at the same time, you know, the other side of that is that even though it's a universal habit, uh, the different drugs that are used in different cultures and the ways in which they're used are incredibly specific and uh, different. You know, so there's incredible diversity. Um, of, uh, you know, inside this, uh, that sort of human unity. So here's, I mean, here's an example of a culture that has, um, you know, sort of drug use right at the centre of it. This is a drawing uh, done by a um, Tucano man from the uh, uh, northwest Amazon, from up the Rio Negro, and this is a drawing of um, what he sees on um, when he takes ayahuasca. Uh, what's um, particularly interesting about the Tucano, I think, is that they're very um, simply organised society. They don't have a lot of hierarchy. They're not very sort of stratified. So um, one of the main sort of social rituals that they have is taking ayahuasca together. And um, when they take it together, they all kind of have the same visions in, in the sense that they all, you know, um, interpret interpret them in the same way as going to the same place. So their idea of what happens when they take ayahuasca is that they become um, the first people, the first men. Oh, they remain themselves, but they're also at the same time their own ancestors, you know, and they're back in the moment of creation, and the plants around them are the first plants and so on. So the whole idea of, create, of, of creativity and creation is um, associated with um, these sort of uh, um, drug-induced altered states. So all the kind of decorative motifs on their sort of body art, on their sort of houses and uh, pottery and everything, they all refer back to their sort of ayahuasca visions. So that's an example of a culture where um, the sort of mind-altering drug is right at the very, very centre of society, you know, and the whole idea of art and creativity is completely associated with it. Of course, the Tikana would not call ayahuasca a drug. They'd be horrified at the idea that um, anybody might call it a drug. But they do understand, um, you know, what a drug is, you know, if you say to them, Apparently, you know, to talk to them about drugs, they'll say, oh yeah, drugs, that's uh, stuff like cocaine, you know, that people in the cities take, that's really, really bad. Yeah, no, 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 we don't do any of that. You know, they chew coca leaf and tobacco, they've got a fantastic drug culture, but drugs for them are something else. And I think that's kind of, uh, that's a theme that you keep coming back to when you look at how the word drugs is used. It kind of, one of the things it means is sort of other people's drugs, you know, sort of foreign habits. Our own drugs, we don't even think of as drugs, you know, alcohol. Caffeine, um, nicotine, nobody really calls them drugs. They're transparent, you know, because they're everywhere in our culture. Here's another example of a completely different drug that has a sort of central role in the culture in a very different, diff different way, in a very different part of the world. This is um, a carver ceremony in uh, what's now uh, Tonga. In fact, this is the first ever sort of Western image of a carver ceremony, which was um, drawn by the artist on. Captain Cook's third voyage, and as you can see here, sort of formal gatherings, state occasions, as we might call them now, are always mediated with a kind of kava ceremony. What's interesting about kava, I think, in um, certainly in Vanuatu, where I've sort of um, seen it most closely, is the number of different ways in which it's used. So it's it's a medicine. I mean, it's got lots of amazing medicinal properties. It's antibacterial, it's antifungal, and so on. It's got lots, <coughs> lots of medical uses, you know, and it has medical uses in the West too. But it's also very, very important socially and ritually. So uh, when you go to see someone, you give them kava, or when people come to you, they drink kava. It's it's a, a, all sort of mediating all the meetings between different um, family groups, different tribal groups, at weddings and so on, and it's all really carefully worked out. There's different types, different cultivars of kava that are used in different contexts, so it kind of mediates all kinds of social rituals. It's also a kind of euphoric, but like a recreational drug. People get together and drink it in the evening um, and, uh, you know, sort of get high together. But then it's also got what you'd call something more like a spiritual component. So you can, in that situation, you can wander off, you know, and kind of enjoy your sort of carver high on your own and 
you can sit on the beach and you can listen to the waves and you can hear voices, you know, maybe voices of ancestors or sort of, you know, family or sort of, um, you know, people you used to know. So we tend to use all these adjectives very confidently here, like, oh, that's a medicinal drug, or, oh, that's a recreational drug, or oh, that's spiritual, you know. But something like kava is very interesting because you can see that actually it's just a continuum, you know, a substance like that can be all these different things. So um, it's still very central um, to the political organisation of a lot of um, South Pacific um, nations, um, and it's still um, drunk at state ceremonies and so on. Here's a very interesting uh, example for us. This is um, the state. Um, this is a sort of Fijian state ceremony where the uh, head of state is being uh, welcomed. Um, this is in 1982, and. Um, this is the Queen being given some carbo to drink. She's been given it in a sort of traditional <coughs> coconut shell, which is how you drink it. She doesn't look like she's looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's 30 seconds very much. <laughs> but um, she's a game old bird. I'm sure she'd chug it all down. <laughs> well, maybe not the uh, really horrible gritty bit at the bottom. But, uh, you know, but then at the same time, if the head of state of Fiji, if the president of Fiji came to um, England, he'd be expected to uh, go to Buckingham Palace and drink tea, you know, which would probably be just as culturally strange for him. <laughs> um, so, um, what are our drugs then? If every culture's got their own drugs, you know, what are the ones that um, we have in the West, you know, and how have they been added to? That's really what I'll try and do now quickly is a quick whistle stop tour of um, our idea of drugs and what they are and how we've encountered them and how we got to the position we are today. So going right back to sort of earliest written sources um, in the West, um, there are um, kind of two drugs that were, you know, that, that you know that, that are really our traditional drugs that you know there's loads and loads of evidence for and clearly been used in unbroken succession from uh, prehistory to the present day, and one is alcohol and the other is opium, you know, so uh, um, this actually is um, a renaissance herbal from the sort of 16th century, um, and uh, so it's a beautiful picture of a poppy plant, and then what you got with these renaissance herbals, they rounded up all the classical knowledge, so the pages that accompanied that, you'd have like little bits of what everybody said, you know, what did Dioscorides say about opium, and what did Pliny say, and what did Galen say, you know, and so you can you, so you know from that that basically opium has been very well understood in the West for a very long time. People understand that it kind of makes you sleepy, it takes pain away, uh, it can be very pleasant, it can give you kind of lovely dreams, um, and if you take too much, you know, you can overdose on it. You know, all that kind of understanding goes way, way back. The other sort of plants in that you know that are recorded in the same way are. Um, the sort of family of nightshade plants. This is mandrake, but um, it's kind of related to uh, other plants like um, belladonna, sort of deadly nightshade, um, you know, datura, wolfsbane, all these kind of plants, which all have these um, uh, uh, substances in like scopolamine, tropane alkaloids, they're called. They're very, very powerful sort of deliriants, but also very, very highly toxic. You've got to be very, very careful with the dosage. Um, because they, uh, you know, if you take too much, you get kind of amnesia and go into comas and die. You know, in small doses, they can give you sort of delirium fevers, and they were often combined together with opium, um, drowsy syrups of poppy and mandragora, as Shakespeare put it. And that was kind of uh, so. That's I think you know that's our sort of native spectrum of drugs. Really, is kind of alcohol and then opium and. Um, and all these uh, nightshades. And I think that's kind of significant, you know, the idea of a sort of drug that comes with us from our European inheritance, very different from other parts of the world. But for us, it's kind of very much in that dark, kind of narcotic end of the spectrum. You know, these are things that knock you out and you've got to be a bit careful with them because if you take too much of them, they're really toxic, you know. Um, here, in the same, um, uh, same book, is another, um, another plant that we'll recognise. Um, but what's interesting about this is that if you read the descriptions that I was talking about of all the sort of what everybody says about these, there's loads and loads of medicinal uses given. Um, you know, like its seeds are good for headaches, or you can sort of press its leaves together and make a poultice, which is very good for putting on wounds. But you won't find anything in there 
which says that cannabis gets you high. And that is probably because cannabis sort of in these kind of northern latitudes doesn't get you high. You know, it was grown, it was, it was hemp, it was grown as a sort of fibre crop. So it was well known as a crop, but it's kind of, um, you know, it, but not really as a, as a drug. You know, its mind-altering properties weren't that well understood. But there was a lot of interesting, um, this is a great image from that time, sort of 17th century, in terms of the way that intoxication was described. Here's a sort of visual image, in a visual language that we've almost totally lost. This is called Bell Belladonna Madness. Mm -hmm. And this figure here in the foreground has taken some Belladonnas running, he's being chased by ghosts and skeletons, and sees a skeleton there pursuing him. And these figures up in the sky, these are all the planets, and they're kind of beaming their planetary influence down on him. So there's a whole language for talking about intoxication, you know, that, that, we've, uh, that we've forgotten. This was the part that changed everything. This was um, the first um, drug that we adopted here in the West that had come from somewhere else, the first foreign drug, if you like. This is one of the very first Western drawings of the tobacco plant. So pretty much as soon as Christopher Columbus got off the boat, you know, on his first voyage um, in the Caribbean, almost the first thing he saw um, was a bunch of Native Americans sitting around smoking tobacco in cigars. And the early um, sort of explorers and conquistadors, everywhere they went, um, they were struck, well, first of all, by the incredible botanical knowledge that Native Americans had. You know, almost all of them just dumped Western medicine when they got there and started using the native stuff, you know. And, uh, but also, particularly, the, the most valued um, plant all across the Americas seemed to be tobacco. And people would, um, as well as smoking it, they'd kind of chew it, they'd snuff it, um, you know, they'd um, drink it in liquid, they'd take it as enemas, you know, pretty much any way you can possibly imagine they'd use it. And again, like Carver, its use had all kinds of, was right across the spectrum, it was used sort of medicinally and kind of, and it sort of had sacred uses and also kind of recreational ones. That's a, that's a beautiful image of kind of uh, early American tobacco use, that's a Mayan priest smoking a cigar, that's from the, from the altar at Palenque actually, so that's an example of a tobacco culture that had in fact vanished, you know, before the um, Spanish, before Europeans even got there. So tobacco came back to Europe um, and to start off with it was very fiercely resisted. It was seen as a sort of horrible sort of uh, barbarian foreign habit and people who smoked were locked up. Um, but it spread really fast and it became, uh, you know, a, a sensation, you know, it's the first, uh, you know, there was nothing like that in the sort of Western repertoire. Um, one of the things that really helped to spread it was the Thirty Years' War. You know, you had all these armies going all over Europe, so when you've got large numbers of young men all hanging out together, like 90% of the time doing nothing and really bored, and 10% of the time under extreme stress, you know, that's got to be the ideal conditions for incubating the tobacco habit. <laughs> and it um, spread all around um, Europe, and then Europeans, sort of British, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, um, started trading it all around the world, and tobacco became the world's first real sort of global drug habit. Um, so, uh, but everywhere it, it was taken, it was kind of changed and adapted in the same way that, um, uh, you know, the individual pipe, you know, that's a very good example of a sort of European innovation, because when you had pipes in Native American culture, you'd almost always share them like a peace pipe. Um, as soon as we got it here, they, you know, suddenly it was like, oh, I've got my own, I'm going to go to the shop and get a nice pipe, and that's my pipe, you know. Um, uh, tobacco arrived in Africa and immediately got a whole different tradition of pipes going on there. You know, when it came around to the sort of Middle East and Arab countries, people developed water pipes for smoking it in, and India, people started adding it to the betel nut mix and chewing it. That's a fantastic uh, Japanese tobacco jar. Um, from the sort of, uh, and so as soon as it got to Japan, they kind of developed a particular way of sort of shredding it, you know, cutting it very fine and smoked it with beautiful long thin pipes, you know. So everybody got the tobacco habit, but everybody customised it in their own different ways. And tobacco was only one of a number of sort of um, what you might call soft drugs that started circulating all around the world and that were really the beginning of um, global trade. Here's a really nice um, image illustrating that. You've got your um, Persian um, man with his coffee and um, Chinese man with his tea and your Aztec with his chocolate. 
you know, that's sort of symbolising all the different, you know, the way in which all these different substances go around the world. We might not think of tea as a drug now. Um, if you look at, like, the, you know, the sort of stuff that appeared when tea first arrived here, you know, you really think it's like people are writing about sort of um, crystal meth or something, you know. Um, it was, uh, you know, for a culture that had never, ever had caffeine, you know, tea was, and, and indeed any stimulants, you know, all we'd had was these narcotics. So the idea of anything that kind of woke you up and perked you up was a total novelty. Um, really popular in different parts of the world. And you can see again the way that um, everybody sort of, uh, you know, you, you get all the accessories that go along with it. Like the, uh, the Persian coffee um, mug down there and the sort of teapot and the coffee, and the, the chocolate pot, you know, they're all sort of, all got their own distinctive accessories and everything that, um, that goes with them. So, you know, by this time you were starting to get the beginnings of a sort of global drug culture and people were starting to understand, you know, what drugs people in other cultures took. <coughs> Here's a figure who really systematised that for the first time. Um, this is Linnaeus, who's a great sort of Swedish naturalist who gave us the sort of, you know, classifi uh, the Latin classification system of plants and animals that we use today. He's here in his um, shaman outfit. His first um, uh, natural history trip was up to Lapland, and he came back with this whole sort of uh, shamanic kit. Um, but he was the first person to write a kind of global directory of, 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 of drugs, which was called uh, Inebriantia, Inebriants, which he wrote in uh, 1762. And it's the first kind of list of all the drugs, you know, including alcohol and sort of tobacco and uh, everything else that different people use in different parts of the world. And he's, you know, he's got coca leaf chewing in there, and he's sort of figured out that um, you know, in um, tropical climates and subtropical climates, then cannabis produces this really powerful stuff called hashish. You know, that's in there, and sort of betel nut and all the ingredients he kind of knows about. And, he's, and with, from this perspective, he says, we can see now, basically, that every culture has its own drugs. So you know, that was the first um, time that I think that people really um, realised that that was the case. Um, the, the other thing that started happening around that time during the Enlightenment was new drugs started appearing thanks to chemistry. And this was um, the first and most spectacular one. This is the discovery of nitrous oxide, laughing gas, which was discovered by a chemist, Humphrey Davy. That's him there with the, 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 with the bellows. And this is a kind of um, satirical cartoon of him sort of taking his nitrous oxide to the Royal Institution, and that's all the sort of great and the good of London, all kind of having their huffs of laughing gas. And this was an amazing thing at the time. If you think, I still think it's an amazing thing now. You know, this is a plant, you know, this is not plant, you know, this is a pure substance that's never existed in nature, just appeared in the laboratory, and somehow you take a lungful of it, and you get not only this really powerful euphoria, but also, you know, this amazing sense of cosmic revelations. You know, how does that happen? How does that work? How can it be, you know, that the human mind can be sort of altered so dramatically by this substance that comes out of a laboratory? Um, it was a question that um, science couldn't really answer at that point, and the medical profession didn't really sort of follow through on it. So uh, where um, nitrous oxide experiments really took off was in this kind of sort of milieu of poetry. So um, some of the first people who Humphrey Davy gave nitrous oxide to were romantic poets like uh, um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and uh, Robert Southey. Uh, he was always, I mean, what, uh, you know, what interested Davy was, you know, he could, he could synthesize the gas in the laboratory, right, and he could, um, you know, do tests on animals, so he worked out very carefully, you know, how much of the nitrous oxide goes into the bloodstream and blah, blah, but, you know, you weren't really going to get there until you could talk about what it was actually doing in your mind, you know, it was the subjective effects of it that were really interesting. And there's no sort of scientific procedure for that. Davy called it a language of feeling. He said, that's what we need to develop. We need to develop a new language so we can talk about um, what this gas is doing. And that was very much what the Romantic poets were also trying to do. They were trying to develop a language of feeling, ways of talking about kind of states of consciousness that had never been described before. So from this point on, um, the sort of science of drugs kind of mixed in with poetry and philosophy in ways that were really interesting. This is the figure that we associate most with that, um, with, with, with that period, not, not Vincent Price, obviously, <laughs> but um, Thomas de Quincey, his Confessions of an Opium Eater was the first, um, I guess it's the first real sort of um, best-selling work of drug literature, and it was the first time that uh, somebody had uh, really set out to describe, you know, what 
opium in this case does, and to describe it in ways that no doctor would have ever thought of describing of it, just describing it to talk about his life and how he encountered it and the sort of visions it gave him and the sort of dreams and the ways it remains. He remember his childhood and the ways when you know he could sort of then suddenly understand how all the sort of images in his head were put together. You know, it was really sort of you know beautifully kind of detailed work, and um, uh, but also very um, you know um, very mischievous, very subversive because um, opium at this point was not a sinister substance. Opium at this point was something that you'd buy in any corner shop. It was something that you'd have in every kitchen cabinet, you know, no aspirin, no paracetamol. Um, so um, opium was what everybody used um, for fevers, for pains, for sleep, for sort of diarrhea, dysentery, you know, all kinds of conditions. Opium was the only remedy. So uh, what De Quincey was saying was, you know, this innocent thing that's just lurking in your bathroom cabinet, actually there's a whole world in there, you know. Um, so that's in a way, that's the beginning of a sort of drug counterculture. I think you can sort of trace it back to that. This is the other thing that was happening to opium at the same time, um, was in China, people started smoking it. And I think this is a really good example of how um, the sort of mode of administration, the way in which a drug is taken, um, really affects its meaning. Because opium was always something that um, had been thought of in the West as a medicine. It was sort of something that you just have like a little sip of on your own, you know, if you were if you were ill. Or, um, but then in China, what had happened was um, tobacco smoking had caught on, and then people had started mixing opium with tobacco. Um, pretty much, uh, um, pretty quickly realised that actually you needed quite a different sort of pipe for smoking opium from smoking tobacco because um, opium you're trying to sort of vaporise it, heat it very gently, tobacco you're just trying to burn the shit out of it, you know, so uh, um, if, you, if you just combust a tobacco and opium mixture you're wasting most of the opium, so you did develop, the, the, so the Chinese developed this special kind of opium pipe and um, that really kind of um, made opium into a very different substance, I think, you know, because as soon as you've got a, in a pipe, you're sitting down and smoking it, you know, the rush is much more immediate, it's much more pleasurable, um, people are doing it together and socially, so, so it's, it kind of made opium into what we would now call a recreational drug. But in fact, the Chinese appetite for opium turned out to be extremely useful to the British, um, because... Uh, at this stage, um, Britain was in the grip of a mass epidemic uh, to a drug that could only be got from China, which was tea. So um, the British tea habit by this time, sort of early 19th century, was uh, enormous. And um, tea could only be bought from China. It could only be bought by the East India Company. Uh, and the Chinese weren't interested in anything that we had except silver. So the British Treasury was kind of hemorrhaging enormous amounts of money to sort of support um, the British tea habit. So they, um, so they started looking around for something, um, some commodity that might be able to sell to the Chinese in return. Um, they noticed that the opium habit was picking up in China. And also, just at that time, um, the British East India Company had got their hands on the richest opium plantations in the world, which were in Bengal, uh, in northeast India, around Calcutta and up in the Ganges Delta. And they turned that into this enormous industrial agribusiness, just producing vast amounts of um, opium for the Chinese market. In fact, we had, uh, had this in the exhibition. This is an actual ball of um, uh, British Indian opium from the 19th century, uh, this big, like a sort of cannonball. And just to give you some idea of the scale of the British um, opium uh, production in Bengal, that was the um, British East India um, Company warehouse just outside Calcutta. Um, there was only one problem with selling it to China, though. It was illegal. The emperor had banned it. So what the uh, East India Company did is they sold all this opium to, to, to traders, independent traders, who then went and smuggled it up um, the Chinese coast and um, uh, then... Um, sold it for silver, so the balance of trade kind of swung back the right way and eventually um, when the Chinese complained um, and started seizing British opium and destroying it, then the British sent gun gunboats and sort of uh, pounded their harbours to rubble and made them kind of sign a free trade 
treaty, and that's how, uh, how the British got Hong Kong. And thereafter, you know, the, um, this kind of opium trade out of India was, you know, it was a really significant contributory factor to the um, sort of rise of the British Empire. About 15% of all the revenue coming out of um, the British Raj and, uh, um, uh, and India was, uh, was opium in the late 19th century. It was um, really what kind of drove kind of the British Empire to, the sort of, um, to its sort of global supremacy. Meantime, other um, European countries were having other encounters with drugs in other parts of the world. This is the, uh, the hashish market in Cairo in the 1850s. And Egypt and the Middle East had sort of been a sphere of French influence ever since Napoleon invaded there in 1800. Um, and it was French um, expats and colonials and uh, other people who sort of first started um, discovered hashish, which at that time was, uh, was not usually smoked, it was usually eaten um, often as a, a something called dawamesk, which was like sort of basically hash mixed up with a bit of honey and pistachios and like a sort of hash Turkish delight kind of thing. Um, the first um, European to um, to really have a you know have a big dose of this and write about it was um, this guy uh, Jacques Joseph Moro de Tour, who was a French psychiatrist uh, who spent time out in Egypt. Uh, got very interested in hashish partly because um, he was very interested in sort of mental illness and he wanted to know why there was so little um, mental illness in. Um, in the, in the Arab world uh, compared to Europe and he thought it might have something to do with the fact they didn't drink any alcohol and they kind of had hashish instead. So he took some, his, his, his idea of a dose was about, about an eighth, about three or four grams taken orally, you know, and, um, and he had kind of hours of hallucinations which he kind of records really brilliantly um, and um, he became a real convert. Um, he decided that, uh, it was going to be incredibly useful in um, psychiatry, you know, as a drug. But his idea was not that you should give it to the patients, his idea was you should give it to the doctors. <laughs> because they're the people who spend all day trying to understand people with bizarre mental kind of conditions and sort of odd states hallucinating all the time. And if only they could just take a big dose of hashish, then they'd understand what it was like and they'd be much better doctors. <laughs> but like um, Humphrey Davy, um, Moreau was also very interested in what um, artists and writers and other people would make of it and how they'd describe it and sort of write about it and paint it. So he formed this club um, in Paris called the Club des Hashishim, where kind of the whole sort of literary world of Paris would come and all take sort of big doses of hashish together. It's famously written about by sort of Baudelaire and Gautier, and it shows up in a lot of the literature of the period, sort of you know, Alexandre Dumas, Count of Monte Cristo and stuff. And um, people started kind of describing these, uh, the, the hashish experiences and um, illustrating them. And that became, you know, it's, it's interesting kind of in the late 19th century, you just there's a lot of this stuff in very sort of straight contexts. So this, for example, is in um, The Strand, which is a very mainstream sort of British magazine in the 1890s. It's just like a piece called Hashish Hallucinations, and it's just like, lots of descriptions, different people's descriptions of their kind of hashish hallucinations with these amazing trippy images. Can you read that? It's saying, he distinctly saw within himself the drug he had chewed. Like, <laughs> like sort of eating a big lump of hash, he's like looking into his stomach. <laughs> <laughs> this is the other substance that kind of would become a modern drug um, that was kind of legally and very, very widely available at the time, um, was um, cocaine. Um, firstly, in the form of cocoa wine, which was a sort of sweetened wine with lots of, uh, which cocoa leaves had been soaked in. Um, and again, it was, a, you know, it was a stimulant. Here was something that was stronger than a cup of tea. You know, it was, um, you know, here was something you could drink, you know, if you had it in the middle of a busy day, you know, or if you didn't have much time to eat or you needed to keep going. Um, you know, as I said, um, there you go, sleeplessness, anemia, all kinds of sort of, you know, a marvellous restorative, all kinds of medical uses. It was really, I guess, the sort of the red bull of its day, you know, sort of <laughs> stimulant energy drink. Um, so that became extremely popular. There's a beautiful um, French example, you know, so it's sort of for convalescence, you see, it's kind of medicinal as well. If you're feeling a bit sort of weak or sort of out of sorts, you know, a bit of, uh, a bit of cocaine will perk you up. <laughs> Cannabis by this time starting to appear, you know, in high street chemists and uh, so on. It's very interesting reading the sort of cannabis literature around this point. 
um, because so much of today's sort of, um, stuff about medical cannabis is really clearly there. Everybody's saying this is really good for muscle spasms and um, for nausea and sort of appetite, you know, all the things that people are talking about now were well understood. Um, but cannabis also had the same problem that it has now. You couldn't, it wasn't like cocaine, you couldn't kind of you know, reduce it to an active ingredient very easily. So you always had these Indian cannabis, Indian hemp sort of powdered mixtures, which you never knew quite how strong they were or what they were like. But, you know, but it was kind of, um, uh, you know, it was there, you know, in all the chemists and famously um, Queen Victoria's doctor was a big fan and wrote articles in the Lancet about what a useful medicine it was. That's a good example of uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, cocaine, a sort of pure drug thing. Um, Forced March, that was a big seller for the virus welcome, and that's basically cocaine and caffeine tablets. And uh, that carried, you, you, you can get that, um, you know, for, all the way through to the to First World War, you know, it was a really, really big seller. And that's probably the most um, famous one of all these sort of new pharmaceutical drugs was um, heroin. Um, heroin originally was the brand name, you know, from biopharmaceuticals, you know, who just produced um, aspirin the previous year, so heroin was like the next thing, and that was, um, that was sold as a, basically as a cough medicine, as a cough suppressant, so you could um, buy that over the counter. There you are, there's a great example, I think. <laughs> that's basically, that's heroin and cocaine throat pastels. <laughs> You can tell this is going to end in tears. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's not, you know, it's not completely ridiculous, I have to say. You know, there's no doubt, you know, heroin is very, very good at suppressing coughs. Um, cocaine, you know, definitely dries out those nasal packages. Uh, you know, but also, at the same time, you know, it's almost getting to the point where you could put, like, heroin and cocaine in anything and you knew that the patient would sort of end up feeling better after they had taken it before, you know. So this was, um, at this point, drugs were not, they didn't have the negative connotations that they have today because they weren't illegal or illicit or anything you could sort of do. They were just, you know, there was stuff that you could buy along with all the other stuff in the chemists. But that was kind of starting to change at this point. This was what really changed it, I think, was the hypodermic needle. Uh, impossible to overestimate just what an incredible medical breakthrough that was once you had morphine and once you had the hypodermic needle. Um, you know, pain had always been part of the human condition. Almost everybody, all through history, had expected to kind of have to deal with serious, serious pain at some point in their lives. Suddenly, you know, there was relief from pain, almost inst instantaneous, almost total. You know, a shot of morphine, sort of pain gone. And um, uh, doctors used it a lot, used it very heavily. They'd kind of, uh, you know, um, Use it for everything, go on their rounds, they'd use it on themselves, they'd use it on their sort of wives and families. Um, an awful lot of the sort of early, the first generation of kind of, you know, real sort of um, drug addicts, you know, mostly morphine addicts at that point were doctors and dentists and nurses and so on. I mean, that, uh, this is a, my favourite way of kind of tracking, um, you know, the cultural change that uh, drugs go through at the end of the 19th century. This is um, Sherlock Holmes, which was sort of a stage play at the time, injecting himself with cocaine. Dr. Watson looking very disapproving. <laughs> um, so when Holmes came, uh, when, when Conan Doyle came up with the idea of Sherlock Holmes, which is sort of in the late 1880s, he was looking for a way of establishing this character as this kind of eccentric, kind of crazy, slightly on the edge, bohemian, you know, and he had his meerschaum pipe and he had his violin and, um, you know, and he had his cocaine injecting habit. That was kind of seemed like a sort of, you know, interesting, intriguing touch that made him a sort of edgy, exciting character. But, you know, by the um, end of the 1890s, um, he was, you know, Holmes was incredibly successful and Conan Doyle was selling into, um, his stories into American magazines that were, uh, um, you know, also at the same time running anti-cocaine campaigns and you can see him starting to backpedal, you know, he takes out all the drug references and then kind of, um, you know, by the end of the 1890s he said, oh, well, you know, Watson has weaned Holmes from his terrible drug habit, it's all right, it's all gone now. So you can see kind of what's going on there. And this is why you're starting to get, for the first sort of time, these images of sort of injecting drug addicts. And when you first, and this is just about the time when, you know, the idea of addiction is emerging, you know, and in sort of uh, psychiatry as, as a sort of medical concept that hadn't really existed before. And um, 
you know, and you know, it's very much about the medical profession. This is a really grisly image. The weird thing about this is that uh, this guy's a male nurse, you know, as so many of the um, early addicts were. And this is when you start to um, hear the words, see the word drugs written down in the sort of modern sense of drugs, not meaning any drug, but meaning, you know, particularly kind of mind altering drugs. It's almost always short for drugs of addiction or drugs of abuse, you know, so there's that very heavy medical sort of um, term that starts to appear. This is the other thing that um, starts to appear around the same time. Uh, this is a very sensationalised image of an opium den. But you've got the idea here that um, drugs are, again, something foreign. It's like other people's drugs. Um, that, uh, you know, in the docks and in the east ends of cities like London, you've got people who are, um, uh, you know, coming over from sort of China, from other cultures, um, who are sitting around sort of taking unfamiliar drugs, smoking opium, and, uh, you know, maybe this is like a plague or a disease that's going to spread. Um, and, of course, there's always the idea that this might be deliberate revenge for the, um, all the addiction to opium that, um, you know, the British inflicted on China in the Opium Wars. So by this time we're starting to get, I think, the sort of to recognise the um, picture that we uh, have today of drugs. You're starting to get this idea that, uh, that there's something wrong, that sort of medically they're dangerous, culturally they're foreign, and within the next generation as they started to be prohibited, you'd also get the sense in the word drugs um, that, there's, uh, that they're illegal, you know, so, um, people, so drugs kind of means illegal drugs as opposed to, say, pharmaceutical drugs or, you know, over-the-counter drugs or prescription drugs or whatever. So, if you want to know how we got from there to here, um, you'll have to read the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope I've given you a brief sense of kind of how our idea of drugs emerged and developed. I hope I've at least convinced you that drugs were not invented in the 60s. And I hope I've left a bit of time for some questions. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to open up for uh, some questions. Um, I'll take uh, my usual prerogative, uh, my kind of catchphrase and, and phrase, and uh, kind of start the ball rolling. But I was hoping you were going to give us a little bit of an inkling of, of where we all went wrong and, and how we ended up. Uh, with the situation of, of the legality, what was the kind of what were the real turning point issues that kind of took us into this kind of uh, massive era of prohibition? <laughs> big question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big question, and to, to answer it, you have to kind of expand the frame sort of really wider and look at um, uh, alcohol and the whole idea of intoxication. Because at the time when um, these drugs were being prohibited. Some of them, I should point out, you know, like the morphine and heroin and cocaine, you know, there's no problem with mescaline and, um, you know, even with cannabis at this point, you know, which is another interesting story. But what's going on, what this is all part of, is a sort of big debate about um, whether intoxication itself is kind of okay in modern societies, because all the way through the 19th century, you had this big sort of temperance movement um, that was trying to stop um, excessive alcohol drinking, you know, because people had been, um, you know, cities particularly had been kind of fueled on alcohol, which was, you know, they were getting bigger and bigger and alcohol was getting cheaper and cheaper and more and more available. You know, levels of public drunkenness, you know, were enormous. And, uh, you know, there was a kind of big sort of middle class movement of people saying, you know, this is, you know, we can't manage, you, know, you know, a modern civilised society can't tolerate this. And it was an interesting coalition, you know, some of it was religious voices, of course, but a lot of it was very progressive people saying that, you know, a lot of the, you know, the women's movement was very centrally involved, you know, because they were saying, look, you know, um, you know, our men are going out to work and getting paid, and then they're just spending all their money on alcohol, and they should be bringing it back, you know, for the household budget, whatever. So there was big, um, you know, medical and religious and social sort of reform movement. And um, really, a lot of the de debate about, uh, about other drugs gets sort of carried in the wake of that, you know. Um, and um, that was the movement that ended up, obviously, with the prohibition of alcohol in the United States. So weirdly, what happened was that um, prohibition of alcohol collapsed because alcohol was too widely used, um, really, for it to sustain. Um, but at that point, the sort of drug-using population was quite small. It was basically some ethnic minorities, you know, using particular drugs. Um, 
a very small sort of bohemian sort of um, criminal subculture, not much. Medical users, you know, a lot of people sort of, um, you know, on morphine maintenance and so on. Um, but there was no, you know, like with um, alcohol, there was a big sort of business lobby of sort of people trying to get it sold. There was nobody lobbying for, you know, the right to use drugs. So weirdly enough, the whole the prohibition of alcohol, which was the big issue, sort of crashed and burned and collapsed. And then the prohibition of drugs, which had been carried on into wake, just continued. Um, and then particularly in America, after the collapse of alcohol prohibition, that's, you know, the alcohol bureau there was, that was a lot of coppers with nothing to do. You know, so they all moved into the narcotics bureau, and that was when the kind of America really started its war on drugs and kind of passed all the sort of international you know, laws and conventions that are our drug laws today. And that all happened really kind of before there was, you know, long before the 60s, long before there was anything like a drug culture. So, you know, the laws that we've got now were designed for a totally different world. Brilliant, Mike. Um, it was interesting, there was a news piece, I think, last week about they were trying to get through a new uh, compulsory drug testing law, uh, but it got dropped when they, they, they amended it so that law enforcing agents had to also kind of be uh, available to compulsory drug testing, so they actually dropped it. So it's kind of <laughs> curious. Really. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, again, there's a big lobby that people who sell drug testing kits you know, that's a, you know, that's a big industry sector and, you know, there's no shortage of, um, you know, corporate and government people you can go to saying, you know, you really should be tough on drugs, you should do this drug testing. There's not a lot of kind of, you know, managers in that position who are going to say, actually, no, I think the civil liberties of my employees are more important, you know, so again, you know, that's commercial lobbying driving that. Absolutely. We're opening up some questions. Yeah, some questions in the book. Uh, one at the back there and then one here and then one there. Get started. I'm going to have a mic, so just yeah, speak uh, up, please. I, you showed uh, Carl Linnaeus coming back there with all of his uh, shamanic paraphernalia, um, but you haven't mentioned mushrooms at all. Are they always like a minority interest? Oh, that's a really interesting um, question. Uh, there are, um, from ar around that time, there is there's one really brilliant um, drawing of a, a, a bunch of liberty cats. It's in, in that book, actually, with sort of uh, identifying them as sort of intoxicating. Um, and, but then that sort of seems to have been lost and forgotten. You know, there's, um, there's quite a lot of um, sort of descriptions of accidental intoxications, but that's the way that mushroom trips tend to get reported as, as, a, as sort of poisonings. You know, which if you think about it, you know, if you took a whole a bunch of mushrooms and you didn't know there was such a thing as like a psychedelic mushroom trip, you know, and they started coming on, the first thing you'd think was, I've eaten some mushrooms that are poisonous, you know, and, um, you know, maybe they're going to kill me. It's just not a very good, um, not a very good foot to go off into a trip with, you know, you're very liable to um, flip over on takeoff, as they say. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> most of the accounts of um, mushrooms that you can find are, you know, in that, you know, there are descriptions of poisonings and so on. Um, so it's, it's only when you get to the point that people realise that there's a kind of really valuable, sort of amazing visionary experience to be had, you know, that it starts to sort of take hold in the sort of culture. And that really starts when Gordon Wasson goes to Mexico in the 1950s and finds Maria Sabina and people still taking mushrooms. And after that point, the idea is there, you know, that, you know, uh, that mushrooms aren't just a poisoning, you know, they're not, they're kind of, there's a really intense, amazing psychedelic, visionary, spiritual experience to be had, and that's when you start to see it kind of uh, really pick up. I was going to follow on about that, about Linnaeus. So, he, he didn't write anything about Flag Eric, because obviously the Sami, who I presume... Yeah, that's right. right. No, he mentions Flag Eric. He does. And yeah. Was, was he drinking the, uh, the urine of the shamans? There's, there's... That kind of gets described quite early on. Um, he didn't, he was like, um, He's funny, Linnaeus, the drugs. He thinks definitely like the worst, the most dangerous drug by far is distilled alcohol. That was what really freaked him out up in the north, was seeing villages where kind of everybody was um, sort of, uh, you know, drinking sort of uh, um, <laughs> aquavit and stuff. And uh, he thought that that was, um, uh, you know, that, that was the one that he really had to worry about. Um, he, he, was, um, he smoked tobacco all the time. He was really into the health benefits of tobacco. Um, they thought it was really good for, um, you know, uh, protecting you against flu and infectious diseases because it kind of, you know, sterilised everything in the facility, you know, sort of purgative. 
Uh, and coffee, he was a bit worried about coffee, he thought it was like he kind of aged you prematurely and stuff. So um, he did take some drugs and not others, and his views on them are interesting, yeah. There was a question here and then come back. Yes, uh, just wondering, taking the perspective of history, what do you think about the future of drug culture? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, there are a lot of um, kind of, uh, they've been, uh, they've slightly died off now, but about 10 years ago there were lots of kind of really wild sort of predictions about, uh, you know, you're going to have sort of digital drugs and stimulate our brains directly and kind of everybody was going to have, um, you know, all these kind of like uh, smart drugs and mood enhancing, you know, kind of constantly <coughs> tweaking our sort of neurology and stuff. And that hasn't really kind of happened. Um, I'm sure it will, I'm sure amazing things will come along, you know, I mean, who could have predicted ecstasy appearing, you know, more, more recently, you know, all this sort of everything from sort of um, ketamine to salvia to sort of mephedrone to all the new kind of cannabinoids, um, you know, I mean, new, amazing new drugs do appear all the time, it's very hard to tell um, how they're going to uh, develop. A lot of it depends on um, what happens with the drug laws. You know, because well, if drugs are illegal, it's kind of really obvious now that um, people are just going to keep sort of synthesising. It's, good. it's just it's so easy to stay one step ahead of development. But I think, um, you know, I'm also struck, you know, looking at it historically, I'm struck by the continuity. You know, you see something like kind of a poppy field where opium has been produced for thousands of years. And you think, well, however crazy the future is, whether we've all got jetpacks or living on the moon or not, you know, you just bet that people will still be like smoking cannabis and kind of, you know, sort of opium and coca and those kind of old traditional plant drugs. I'm sure they're not going to go away. Tim Leary said that 10% um, of humanity abuses um, intoxicants, psychedelics, and other forms of power. Would you agree? Um, I don't know, I'd be quite as doctrinaire as Tim about my use of the word abuse or um, my, the figure of 10%. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think, um, I don't know, depending on how you define abuse, maybe it's less than that, maybe it's more than that. But, uh, um, but I don't, yeah, I, 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 mean, I tend not to use the word abuse. People use all kinds of different drugs in all kinds of different ways. You know, and even some of the sort of patterns of drug use that look most self-destructive are actually kind of um, weirdly kind of um, good ways of, you know, uh, that used by people for coping with all kinds of very difficult stuff. So uh, I prefer not to judge. Isn't it always the dealer that's got the uh, you mentioned the opium wars of China. Uh, but you haven't said too much about the sort of darker history of drugs that used as a sort of warmongering way of uh, sort of, uh, instilling uh, disinformation and, and almost uh, creating a, uh, enmity in people, you know, the actual use of drugs at, as a conduit for disinformation and all that sort of darker side of the use of drugs by the military and, and all that, which is actually quite a, quite a big part of the, the history of drugs. And I'm wondering. Uh, you, you know, talked about the, head, the head, emphasizing the medical side and the medical. Um, but uh, I'm wondering if you've got any comments on that side, the whole history, which you know, the. the, the yeah, well, it's. I mean, you know, by far the most sort of you know, significant and sort of concerted effort was the sort of MK Ultra and associated programs, sort of the sort of post-war in the CIA. You know, and that was a lot of you know that was you know. Um, they were interested in um, in all kinds of stuff. You know, they were some of the first people to use LSD. You know, they used scopolamine, the other things I talked about. I, mean, I think, by and large, um, you know, they were looking for a magic bullet that they never found. Um, you know, they kind of discovered what we know already, which is that you know you can fry people's brains with drugs. You know, you can sort of wipe their memories. Um, but they're not very. You know, it's very hard to get people to do things that they don't want to do, or to make them kind of act in rational ways without knowing what they're doing, you know, all that, all, you know, so, um, I mean, I think in terms of warfare, you know, the sort of long historical view, you know, the big sort of, um, you know, uh, the big story has always been alcohol, you know, most wars have been fought, you know, in sort of alcoholic hazes. I think what was interesting about, um, culturally, about Vietnam was probably it was the first war that wasn't fought with alcohol, you know, it was fought with, uh, you, know, with you know, with sort of other, with, with other drugs. Uh, interestingly, uh, the Unibomber famously was kind of tested on 
it's called the acid uh, experiment T from by the CIA. Is that so, right? Yeah, they said that was like Ken Kesey was. Well, yeah, yeah. Ken Kesey was quite. He was voluntary. He just blew up people's minds and didn't actually blow them. Yeah, yeah. doing so. Um, but famously, uh, so not very good at kind of making controlling people really, perhaps sending them into rebels, perhaps. More questions from the floor. Uh, one about and then out. Do you think any of the current illegal drugs should be legalised? Uh, all of them, yeah. That's a really easy one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Al, why, why is it, do you think, um, that all the, the Chura-related drugs and the, the, the Scopola, the, the drugs in the, the, the Nightshade family, they're so potentially dangerous, yet there is no law banning you from taking They're sort of, given their real, they're really quite tricky things, that they're not illegal. No, and most of the uh, most dangerous um, drugs are totally legal. You know, that's our in nightshades and belladonna. Yeah, really good example. Potatoes contain them if they go green. Yeah, I mean, fly You know, you saw that when kind of uh, magic mushrooms were criminalised in two thousand and five. You know, immediately all the sort of stalls in Camden swapped over to fly agaric. You know, that was like such an obvious harm maximisation policy. You know, because um, you know fly agarics are kind of you know much more dangerous, but they're legal right I, mean, I think so much of it is about it's not about the drugs themselves it's about who's taking them you right. know you can see that you know if if there were loads of people taking to tura you know i'm sure there'd be more efforts to control it um, but it kind of polices itself in a way, it? <laughs> well, I thought that was used as a, a drug. didn't there used to be cigarettes with tura in that were used for asthma uh, yeah, and um, some of the over-the-counter um, remedies for um, seasickness still have like tiny amounts of um, scopolamine, and it's used sort of medicinally in various different ways. Yeah, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I just wouldn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the most dangerous drugs are, are legal, of course, alcohol and tobacco. Okay. Well, that's kind of Wonder why. Clearly, most dangerous. Uh, next question, uh, Danny. In the ancient literature, do you get any um, any ideas of um, people taking too much, or uh, and, and what should be done about it when people do take too much, or is that more modern? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, well, you get some people who are kind of. Um, I mean, it's seen as a sort of weakness or a character. I think. I mean, maybe the classic example is like um, Falstaff in Shakespeare. You know, who always gets drunk. And because he always gets drunk, he's kind of like a great guy, and he's like the life and soul of the party, but at the same time, he's his own worst enemy, you know, and uh, at the end, he's, in the end, he becomes somebody who's like not a serious person, you can't take him seriously, you know, that's the whole sort of drama of him. But you wouldn't say that he had a medical condition, you know, you wouldn't call him an alcoholic. Um, you know, the idea that this was this kind of medical problem is something that definitely like, emerges later, like in the 19th century. And before that, you know, it's really part of a, often a religious kind of um, just debate about kind of, um, you know, sort of temperance and um, sort of deferred gratification. You know, it's kind of seen in terms of sort of a, a moral failing. Yeah, I told you a couple more questions. Yeah. Hey, you talked about the um, opium issues in China and the emperor had, uh, had banned it. Did it. Was there evidence that it, it properly affected the fabric of society? Did opium addiction, and, and therefore, will, if drugs were all legalised, would you say that addictive drugs are likely to affect the fabric of society in a negative way? Uh, the opium in China example is the, really the founding example of the war on drugs. You know, that's always been like, why well, we have to have a war on drugs, because otherwise, will be like China in the 19th century with everybody addicted to opium, you know, and that was the sort of con conventional story for a long time. There's been some really brilliant scholarship recently that has um, unpicked that. Um, almost all the reports we have at the time are either from missionaries, you know, who are, who are sort, of all cam uh, sort of campaigning anti-opium uh, journalists. So you've got these people going around China going, everybody's addicted to opium. But, you know, firstly, you know, there were huge famines going on. You know, China was going through like a real sort of period of um, economic collapse and serious unrest. So there were a lot of people, when there wasn't any food, you know, who would smoke a bit of opium because it would take their appetite away. So, you know, you've got, um, uh, so to see all these emaciated people and go, that's because they're opium addicts. You know, um, people are starting to realize that that's not necessarily, uh, the way it was, and also anybody who smoked opium at all was is described in that literature as an addict. 
Whereas, in fact, most people in China were sort of social opium smokers. People would get together for an evening and smoke a few pipes. So that would be kind of like describing everybody in a pub or a wine bar as an alcoholic. And at the same time, the figures don't quite add up. If you look at um, how many people in China were using opium occasionally, it's actually quite remarkable how few of them seem to have been kind of, you know, really sort of terminally addicted to it. You know, the levels of, um, you know, real problematic use of opium in China, although it's dependent on the environment, seem to be kind of very similar to, you know, alcohol, you know, sort of three, five percent or whatever, if you want to put a rough figure on it. Uh, Alan, I think we just maybe one last question. Uh, that question about the future of drugs, is there not an argument that um, the direction which recreational drugs, drugs will take in the future depend on other patterns in society? Because um, historically you might argue that you know, the coffee, alcohol, tobacco suited an industrial society, didn't interfere with mm -hmm. production and so on. So there's a bigger picture. I think that the politics of prohibition are actually terribly complex in individual particular circumstances. but. We're moving now, uh, to some degree at least, into a sort of leisure society. People expect far more leisure, far more entertainment, for example, that, um, that maybe those kinds of patterns, those kind of greater developments within society will determine which drugs are tolerated or legalised or, or otherwise. Yeah, I think that's right. I think so much of it is about kind of um, cultural um, currents and you know, cultural patterns which are very hard to predict and very hard to control. And I think that's why prohibitions on drugs don't work because um, you know these are things that kind of happen from the sort of bottom up you know they're not the kind of things that uh, except in kind of places like Singapore government can say everybody stop doing this and everybody stops but you know maybe sort of drugs are part of a sort of bigger pattern in the leisure society you know like um, you know I think sort of you know you could see sort of for example digital entertainment as a as a drug you know if you look and think of um, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, you know, where there's this kind of drug soma that everybody takes and it keeps the masses quiet, you know. You could say, well, what happens at soma? And then you could say, well, maybe that's actually, that's what TV was, you know. So maybe the next, uh, you know, um, the next sort of civilizational stage we have will kind of be something that will kind of be an, out an outgrowth from that, or maybe halfway between something that we now think of as entertainment and something that we now think of as a drug. <coughs> Brilliant insights there. I think it's kind of probably wrapped up there to an excellent job. And before we thank uh, Mike, uh, we, please do stay and join us and have a chat. Uh, we're going to be partaking of one of the oldest drugs available, uh, wine, of course, um, still legal. And uh, there are some books of Mike's uh, on sale downstairs. Please do join us again. The Ecology, Cosmos, and Consciousness Lecture Series, the end of the month. And thank you very much.